Amen. All right. Thanks for having me out uh, this evening. All of you appreciate it. It's been a little over a year, I think, that since last time I was out here. And amen. The church has been growing. Praise the Lord. This is, this is awesome. I was asking if you still meet in the same place. I remember parking last time. I should have given myself a little bit more time to get here. Apologize for that, but been very, very busy lately. Brother Mejia, what, what, what title did you choose for, for my sermon tonight? Brother Mejia asked me for, for a YouTube-friendly title. I thought that might be a good idea. because The way things used to be. The way things used to be. We're gonna, I'm gonna, we'll get into to the real title of my sermon <laughs> in just a minute. But I wanted to start reminiscing a little bit. I actually had a different sermon planned. When Brother Mejia asked me if I wanted to preach, when I told him I was going to be in town, um, I had a different idea for preaching to the church here, but in light of everything that you guys are dealing with, with the battle that's going on, it's a very important battle, by the way. I don't want to repeat everything that Pastor Mejia just said. Uh, obviously, it's a lot of great wisdom there, and, and, and uh, definitely take heed to all, all, all the advice and, and um, instruction that he's been giving you guys, because that's going to get you through this. But um, in light of all of that, I was, you know, we were driving partway here, and, and I was with my wife and, and my family, and I don't know, the, this, this reminder came, came in my mind from the very first time I came to L.A. I was, I was, I was trying to remember exactly when it happened, and, and that's what ultimately made me change my mind on the sermon I'm going to preach tonight. It was a story going back. Now, we have a lot of, a lot of younger people in general in the room this goes back to about 1988 or 1989 is about as close as I can pin this story to. Who was alive in 88 or 89? All right, good. <laughs> at, least, at least half of you guys, right? <laughs> it's a different time. It's a different time, okay? And, and you know what? Uh, there's a lot of th- in a lot of ways, it was better. But, but just to illustrate how different it was, the... W- I was out here for a family vacation, okay, and I was young. I wasn't, you know, I'm not that old, right, 88 or 89. I was probably like, um, I don't know, maybe 11 years old or 12 years old, something like that. And for those of you who don't know, I, when I was growing up, I used to be a competitive swimmer, right? Now, being 11 years old, that's not very old, right? You, you kind of, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, you start to feel like you're a little bit more grown up, but you're still a kid, right? Everyone still looks at you as a kid. And the reason why I bring that up is when we're, when we're here, I was here for a family vacation, we went to the beach. And I forget which, we went to multiple beaches. We went to Venice, we went to Newport Beach, we went to various beaches uh, in California. And because I was a competitive swimmer, I was, in, I was wearing my competitive swim suit. Just Speedos, right? <laughs> now, yes, it's a little embarrassing to say that now, but I was a kid, right? I didn't know any better. Uh, I wasn't raised an independent fundamental Baptist, right? I grew up worldly and, and whatever, right? But when we came here, there was something that I saw that made me really ashamed and really embarrassed when we're at the beach. And there was, a, there was like a pier going off, and I remember there was a, like a brick wall or a, a concrete wall going out for that, that the pier was made off of. And in big black letters that was just printed on the side of that pier. It said, fags and speedos, go home. That was right here in LA. That was down at the beach. You go down to the beach, you see this big sign saying, fags and speedos, go home. And I remember being ashamed and embarrassed because being a fag was not something cool. It was not something that anyone ever wanted to be called or associated with at all. And this was back not that long ago. It was 1988, 1989. I remember, you know, growing up, we call, you know, with your friend, you'd be like, you fag, you, you know, you homo, whatever. Why? Because it, it was, it, it, it is a slanderous term, and it's something that, that should be avoided, that people should not want to be associated with whatsoever. Because it's vile, it's disgusting, and any normal person knows that. And look, I didn't grow up around a bunch, you know, a bunch of, of people who knew what the reprobate doctrine was and things like that because no normal person thinks that that should be tolerated or acceptable. But one of the problems we have now is all the indoctrination and all the, the, 
you know, um, man, propaganda out there. I don't know why my brain was fumbling at that word. Trying to normalize wickedness and perversion. The real title of my sermon tonight is Fags and Speedos Go Home. We need to bring that concept back. You know, back, back when the, the sodomites were in the closet. Back when they didn't want anyone to know about their filth and their perversion. Back before they were glorying in their shame and just, just being out and proud. You know what? They need to go back in the stinking closet. They need to just be, you know, afraid of God would just smite them dead. But we started here in Jeremiah chapter 6. Because here's the thing, you know, L.A. may change. The United States of America may change. But you know who doesn't change? God doesn't change. Amen. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. God doesn't change. This book is timeless. And you know, some of these things that you're dealing with now, and that other churches are dealing with now, because the Sodomites are growing and, and gaining in their, in their influence, Right, and, and they've, they've taken over all the media sources and the movies and Hollywood and everything else that's just pumping this garbage down everyone's throat. This is new for us, but this isn't new in the world. And thank God for his timeless word that we could learn from and understand. And what I want to do this evening is just go over this subject. Yeah, it's not a pleasant subject. It's not something that I like really preaching about. I, like I said, I had a different sermon in mind because a lot of other things I prefer to touch on and preach on than this subject. But you know what? It's important. Yeah. And especially now, it's more important than ever. Right. We need to understand who we're dealing with. We need to understand the type of people. We understand, look, this isn't something new. You know, they want to try to make it something trendy and new. This, this isn't new. There's nothing new under the sun. Amen. And God gives us all the reasoning behind it. And some of the things I want to go over tonight, we're starting Jeremiah chapter 6, where we, where we read, where Brother, uh, Pastor Mejia read the chapter, but there's a lot of things that lead up to societies that will go into such wickedness and perversion. And I kind of want to go over some of that so we can understand uh, where it comes from, and then also to, to safeguard ourselves and prevent ourselves from getting anywhere close to the filth that, uh, that is produced by these sodomites. Now, let's start reading here. We're going to reread in verse number 14. Do you understand why do things go bad? I remember I, I wanted to move to California after we took our family vacation here. I thought, man, this land is great. It's like paradise. It's always nice out here. The weather's great. I mean, I came in today, right? It's like, it, it, it's beautiful. I, I, I moved to the south, but I'll tell you what, I'm not driving down with my windows rolled down like I was here this past week, enjoying the great weather and everything else. You got here, beautiful beaches, beautiful landscape, beautiful place to live. I mean, it made me really literally want to move here when I was younger because of that. But what happened? What changed? Well, I'll tell you what, ultimately, what it boils down to, and we're going to see a lot of other things, but where it starts is with the rejection of the Lord. That's where it starts. You know, God has blessed this country. God has blessed this land. God has blessed so much in the past few hundred years and has just poured out his blessing. And th you know what? This isn't the first time he's done that. He's done that in the past as well. He's done that with his own people. He's poured out his blessings, and we're going to see what happens when people start to reject the Lord. Because you end up where we are now, and you, know what? you end up even worse than where we are right now. And it may be hard to believe that things can get worse, but things can get worse. Verse number 14 in Jeremiah chapter 6, the Bible reads, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace. When there is no peace, these are the false prophets that are out there, the, the dead, the, the dogs that can't bark, right? The dogs that just, they're just in it for themselves, that they're just going to tell everyone, oh, everything's great. Oh, we need to accept. Everybody's welcome here. Peace, peace. Everything's just peace. When there is no peace. Yeah, it makes people feel, you know, comforted in the short term. 
It might make people feel real nice when they come in to church. They, oh, you know, I've noticed there's been a lot more just weird people out there. And, and oh, but we're supposed to, you know, you hear the false prophet saying, oh, but we're just supposed to love them. Don't worry about what they're doing. You know, we're going to welcome them in. We're going to try to, you know, do all this stuff. And then say, peace, peace. But you know what? There is no peace. You already got your dose of what the people are really like, of what the sodomites really are like. They show their true colors. You know what? Their true colors isn't a rainbow. The true colors come out when they hear the word of God, when they expose that they really are haters of God. And you're going to unfortunately have to see that and see more of that this Sunday. But you know what? It is what it is. I'm not going to stand up here and say peace, peace when there is no peace. This country, America, is in the position it's in because, for many reasons. From the, from the failing of our forefathers. You know what? I'm not going to just, just tuck tail and run or put my head down and just say, oh, what are we going to do now? You know, we're going to stand up and fight. They may have dropped the ball, but you know what? We're going to pick it back up. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look at verse number 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. This is the difference between a time I was ashamed, and look, I wasn't some homo. I wasn't some sodomite. I just didn't even want to have anything to do with them or even be closely anyway remotely associated with one of those freaks or perverts. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I wanted to leave. I wanted to get some, some trunks, right? I wanted to get some surf shorts. I wanted to get something to cover up because I didn't want anyone thinking that I was one of them. But you know what? They're not ashamed. They don't blush. It doesn't bother them one bit. They go out and expose their wickedness. And, you know, we're going to read in this for a reason because we're going to see what happens to these people. Because this is, look, it's just like today. But we're reading from Jeremiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament. This happened a long time ago, folks. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. And I like what Pastor Mejia was saying earlier, you know, don't be afraid. Because you know what? These words still hold true. Why would you be afraid of someone who's going to fall? Why are you afraid of someone who God's going to have the victory over anyways? There's no reason to fear them. Verse number 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. He's saying, you know what? You guys, you've gotten too trendy. You've got all this, all this new you know, you think everything's so great and new and you're so loving and you want all this equality and you think everything's just so great. He goes, you know what? You need to seek out the old path. You need to go see the right way. God laid out the old path for us. But what did they do? But they said, we will not walk therein. We have nothing to do with that. Verse number 17. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Therefore, hear ye nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. And it's that rejection of God. It's a rejection of his law. It's a rejection of the Lord when he sends people. He sends the watchman. He sends the preacher. He sends people, but when the people just reject, God rejects. And we see what happens. That's the end of this when we close out the chapter. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 20, the Bible reads, To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba? And the sweet cane from a far country. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet unto me. This people is still religious. They're not just a bunch of atheists. They're still pretending to worship the Lord, but they've rejected all his commandments. They've rejected the word of the Lord. But you know what? They like bringing the sacrifices. 
They like bringing things in. They like trying to, to have this form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Bible reads here in verse number 21, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them. The neighbor and his friend shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses set in array as men for war against thee. O daughter of Zion. And look, he's preaching against his own people because this is what happened to the children of Israel. They started going down into these depths of, of wickedness and you know, to the point to where God was even saying, you know what? You're not even as bad as, as Sodom was. Or I mean, you're, you're worse than Sodom was. They had gone way off the deep end and you know what he decided to do? He decided to bring judgment and punishment. People need to be aware that this is the outcome. God's not going to let you, God's not mocked. God's not just going to let you get away with it. God's not going to let this world just get away with all the wickedness and perversion and filth and sin. That's why, you know, part of our job is to try to stay that off. Try to wake people up. Hey, look, this is what's going to happen. You want to be so friendly and so loving, you're more loving than God. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look, we need to be warned. People need to be warned. Verse 24, we have heard the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble. Anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain is of a woman in travail. Go not forth into the field, nor walk by the way, for the sword of the enemy and fear is on every side. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth, and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They're all corruptors. I think you guys have, have noticed that a little bit recently too, right? The grievous revolters walking with slanders. You get a firsthand taste of how the media works. You get a firsthand taste of how the sodomites work. It's all full of slander and lies. You know, that's why I, I don't watch the tell live vision, even for the news, because I know it's all just fake. Yeah. They have their own agenda. They're not going to actually publish the truth, especially not when there's perverts involved. They like pushing that agenda. All the more reason, folks, I'll reiterate this, why it's important to listen to your pastor. When he's saying don't engage them out there, we don't need to give them any, look, they're already doing everything they can to slander and, and, and misrepresent and make you all out to be really bad people. Don't give them any justification with their, for their lies by engaging in a physical battle. Amen. It's not the time for that, and it's not the place. It's not our fight. It's not our fight. They're going to walk with slanders. Verse 29 the bellows are burned, the lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. So this is talking about a founder, someone who's, who's making metal, right, and purifying it. And he's saying he's melting that metal in vain. Because the wicked are not plucked away, meaning that that dross and, that, and the, the, the impurities are just, they're not coming out. And he's saying it's just in vain because they're not, he's not removing the impurities and he likens this, verse 30, reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. See, we read earlier how they were rejecting the Lord. They didn't want to follow his ways. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. And then how does the chapter end? Well, God's calling them reprobate because he's rejected them. He said, oh, you want to reject me? You want to reject my ways? After I've held out my hand, after I've, I've preached, I've sent people to warn you, I've told you the right ways, I've instructed you, and you would not, you refused. Just like Proverbs 1 says, you know what? You know what? Now when your fear comes, I'm going to mock. Amen. I'm going to laugh at your calamity. That's right. That's right. This is what happens when people just refuse to accept the Lord and, and accept his commands. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Same exact truth taught in Romans 1 as is in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 6. 
Same exact truth. Why do things start turning south and they start turning south so fast? Because of people rejecting the Lord. Of course, these days, hey, thank God, these days, Romans 1 has been preached on and hit on over and over and over and over and over and over again. Because you know what? For a long time, for decades, this passage hasn't been being preached. And that was part of the problem. But hopefully you know this passage just as well as I know this passage. And you probably quote the passage because you've heard it preached on so much. Because it's so timely these days. And we have to understand and not let this slip. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold true, the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God. Look, we're not saying peach, peace, peace, peace. It's the wrath of God for those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So what we're going to see here as we continue to see this here, people don't have an excuse. The Sodomites don't have an excuse. The perverts don't have an excuse. You know what? The Christians don't have an excuse either. Nobody has an excuse. Because God has made himself known. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody in this world has an excuse. God has made things easy enough for us to understand about him and who he is all the way going back to the creation of the world. God has made it so that people could understand who he is. Because it's not that complicated. It's not that difficult. And he's also given us his word. He's given us his messengers. He's given us so much to know about him that there is no excuse. Verse 21 here says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. See, this is where, this is where it starts. It's the rejection of God. They knew it. They heard it. They knew it. But they reject it. They don't like it. I don't like the God of the Bible. I don't like that. Well... You could go ahead and profess yourself to be wise, like they did. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. See, they didn't become atheists. They just don't like the Lord. They're still religious, just like we saw in Jeremiah chapter 6. They still offer their sacrifices. They still like going to church. They still like that kind of stuff. But not when it's the God of the Bible. Not when it's the Lord. They don't like his commandments. So they want to change God. They want to make a God after themselves. But look at what it says in verse 24, wherefore, which means for this reason, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For this cause, for what cause? For, because they rejected God. Because they knew God, but they glorified him not as God. And look, there, there's a difference here. There's a difference. There's a big difference between your average unsaved Joe out there and the person who knew God and they preached the gospel and they understand, I know who God is. Someone's taught me, but you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm rejecting that. That is not your average unsaved person. I remember being unsaved. You probably do too. When I was unsaved, I believed there was a God. I didn't really know much about him. I wanted to find out at one point. At some point, I didn't even care. I wasn't really that interested in it. But I never 
had anyone explain how to be saved. Right. I've never had that happen until after I got saved or until, until right before I got saved, I should say. But for years and years and years, just living life, not really knowing, not really having any type of knowledge of who God really was, picked up a little bit here and there from the Bible growing up in a Christian home, but not, not, not to know what salvation was. There's a big difference between knowing and rejecting and just not knowing at all. Like the Apostle Paul who, who persecuted the church, but he did it ignorantly in unbelief. Because he didn't really he didn't understand the gospel. He didn't, he didn't even get it and grasp it to be able to fully reject it. He was ignorant. Didn't know. That's all ignorant means. You don't know. These are children of the devil. So just like you are born again when you accept that gospel, you hear, you receive, you're born again. When these people are rejected of God... That's when they're, it's, it's a different kind of born again. It's born unto death. Yeah. Become a child of the devil. And just as much as the believer has eternal life abiding on them, they've got eternal death abiding on them. Right. And we can't be unborn from being saved. They can't be unborn from being children of the devil. That's a hard truth. But it's the truth. And you wonder how people turn into freaks and weirdos doing things that make you want to vomit. How could anyone even do these things? How is that even possible? The reason, the only reason, the only reason why that's even possible is because God's rejected them. And this is how we know that they are reprobate and they've been rejected is because they're doing those things. Because what the Bible says in the next verse here. Reverse number 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. God gave them up unto that. They didn't just, just wander into that. God gave them up unto that. For even their women did change the natural use of that, which is against nature. Against nature, by the way. You know, by, na by nature, we have a sin nature. By nature, you may lie. By nature, you may steal. By nature, you may do a lot of things. But you know what? God gave them up to do something which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the nat the, oh look, there's a natural again, the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Yeah. And there's that word reprobate again, and we saw that first mention in Jeremiah chapter six. And lo and behold, wow, that entire chapter was basically about the same exact thing. And it taught the same exact truth. And it taught about people who knew God, they rejected God, and therefore God rejected them. That's exactly what Romans 1 teaches as well. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 30. But how does a whole people or a whole nation go from being pretty godly or relatively godly, right? Like the United States of America started off great. How do they go from that to rejecting the Lord? How about the children of Israel? Right after Moses led them out and, you know, they had all this great victory and, and they saw these great, uh, great events and God was blessing them and, and, you know, giving them that land that flowed with milk and honey and really just allowed them to prosper, how does that happen, especially when God is blessing? Right? When things are continuing to improve and get better and you're just experiencing more and more blessing, how could anybody, especially a nation that has already believed in the Lord, now all of a sudden just turn their back and reject God? And this is kind of the meat of the sermon I really want to get into because this is really important. This, this kind of helps explain how things can get down that bad path. Proverbs 30, a lot of wisdom right here. Look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. 
lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord, or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. And that first part of verse number nine, where he's warning and asking God that he doesn't become too rich and just have too much blessing because he's worried about just being so full that he becomes real proud and lifted up and just says, well, who is the Lord? Who is God anyways? And unfortunately, this is one of those things that happens when people receive a lot of blessings, they start to think of themselves a lot higher than they ought to think. And this will lead you down that proud path of destruction. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 20. And here's the thing. I'm preaching to a bunch of saved people today. You're not reprobate. You can't be reprobate because you're already saved. But let's look at these, these ways of how the reprobation can happen so that we don't go anywhere close to that. Because while you can never lose your salvation and become reprobate, you know, you can be mistaken for someone who is. You can allow yourself to get really, 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 really wicked to a point to where someone wouldn't even know that you're a Christian. That's possible. Let's avoid the pitfalls altogether. Let's use the wisdom like we found in Proverbs chapter 30. It says, hey, look, God, you know, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor because I don't want to, I don't want to be tempted to steal in order to eat. But I also don't want to be rich. Well, please just provide for me the things that I need and, and I don't want to just be too full of myself with all the blessings. You know what? If you live a life with that attitude and that mindset, you'll do well. Amen. People who end up rejecting the Lord completely, there's many examples of this happening throughout history. Every great empire that's been blessed and lifted up have all become decadent, have all become full of themselves, have all been destroyed through their own wickedness. God has brought all of them down because they all get to a point of just having so much substance and luxury that they end up turning to filth and perversion. And then as a result, God has to come in and judge. And the reason why I had you turn to Leviticus chapter 20 is we see here, you know, obviously there's so many examples. You go through Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, all these different empires that have existed. But we have an example in Scripture. And that was the land of Canaan. Before God brought the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, they were very prosperous. They lived carelessly. They didn't even have to build walls, and they lived in an area where they had things provided for them. The land was just full of great fruit. And the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 23, it says, And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. So he's, he's making mention of this land that they're inheriting, and he's saying this is a land that flows with milk and honey. And look, milk and honey are luxury items. I mean, milk is just this, this, this great substance that you have. You're able to drink this milk because even your animals are fed and, and, and doing well. And that you're not starving at all, right? You've got milk, you've got honey. This land is a great land. Remember the spies that went out and they brought back those grapes that were on their shoulders just, just showing how uh, bountiful the land really was and how great of a land it was. But notice in verse 23, and we're going to see some of the things listed prior to verse 23. He says, he cast out before you the people for they committed all these things. And therefore, I abhor them. God hated the people of Canaan to the point to where when God brought in his judgment, and this is what a lot of people don't understand. And, and a lot of people, you know, especially unsaved people and people who just, just are trying to come to grips with the Bible and, and being able to believe all of it. And this is why these teachings need to be taught more and more and more so that people don't have these questions and not even understanding how this could happen. Because the atheists out there want to mock the Bible and say, oh, you believe in a God that, that commands to kill children and women and all this other stuff? 
But what that shows you, you know, that's not every single war that God's saying to, to just wipe everybody and everything out. That's not every war. It's actually a specific group of people that God said to do that to because it was his judgment coming down upon that wicked nation. And it was the land of the Canaanites. And it's because they did all of these wicked things. And let's take a look at some of these things that God lists in Leviticus chapter 20. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. You know what? That's a serious sin. Cursing out your parents, cursing your father and mother. God put the death penalty on that sin. That's wicked. That's what turns out a generation has no respect that just thinks they can just do whatever they want and they're not listening to the generation before them that has wisdom and trying to guide them in the right way in the old path, but they're willing to curse out their parents. God says that's wicked and wrong. And not just wicked and wrong, but deserving of the death penalty. But that's mild. Let's keep going on here. Verse number 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be surely put to death. These days, no one bats an eye at it. Well, verse number 9 and verse number 10, these days are probably totally acceptable pretty much with the whole world. I wonder where we're headed. Verse number 11, and the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, I'm not one that I don't, you know, just go watching TV or anything like that. But I would bet at this point, and maybe someone can confirm this or deny, I don't know. That people are probably making TV shows about this type of stuff now. This is like the state of your, of your modern sitcom or whatever. Because I know the progression that has been going on when I was watching TV shows. Starting in the days when, when you can have fags and speedos go home written on a wall and no one cared and no one tried to scrub it off and it wasn't a big deal. And in fact, it was probably much appreciated by the beachgoers. Man, would to God we could have that again. I would love to go to that beach. <laughs> we don't have to worry about seeing any, any freaks out there. But again, I, I mean, if these things were to happen, a, a lot of people would probably be like, oh, man, that's weird, or maybe you shouldn't do that. But God's putting a death penalty on all these sins. This is a big deal. And the people that did these things, God said, you know what, I hated them. Because they did all this stuff. But let's keep reading. Verse number 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. It's not what our country is teaching these days. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Verse 14, if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They should be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. This is where we're headed next. I mean, we're already checking the boxes off of pretty much all the rest of this stuff. We don't need to keep even reading this. This is, this is enough. When you get to this point, God wants to wipe you out and destroy you and completely start over because you've gone past salvation as a nation. I'm not talking about the individuals. I'm just talking about, you know what? Because you know what? There were people who were not reprobate that died in the land of Canaan. But as a nation, as a whole, God just said, this, this nation is reprobate. And that's why he brought in judgment, because when people get that wicked, in, in, in a sense, it's going to be better for those kids to not have been brought up in all that and become reprobate themselves. Right. And it's not like God doesn't give people space to repent, because he does. 
And we know that God is long-suffering and merciful. But when people push it too far, when the rejection is just too much, God just says, you know what? I hate this people. Amen. This is where the United States is heading. If not, already is at. I'm not going to stand up here tonight and say, peace, peace, because there is no peace. Amen. Turn over, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. So we see when people get a lot of riches, they have a tendency to forget who God is and not want to have anything to do with God. When you have a lot of riches, another thing comes along with that oftentimes is you have a lot more time on your hands. And you can end up becoming more idle and not having things to do. And I'll tell you what, we're going to see here in Ezekiel chapter 16 that idleness is also a major cause of people rejecting the Lord. Look at verse number 49, the Bible reads, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread. So there's that, that just immense blessings. You've got all, all that you could want, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So Sodom, one, they were full of pride. They thought they only cared about themselves. They thought higher of themselves than everyone else. They had fullness of bread. They were rich, right? They had the well-watered plain. That's what Lot was looking towards, right? Oh, the prosperity of Sodom. Look at what a great land that is. And he filled his mind with their perversion and their wickedness because they had abundance of idleness in her. And then verse 50 says, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. I love reading this passage in this verse. We need it because there's people out here who want to turn to Ezekiel 16, 49 and say, oh, well, see, God didn't even care about the sodomy in Sodom, right, where the, where the whole term even comes from. Like, well, that wasn't even the big deal anyways. They were just proud and idle, and, you know, like, like that was it. No, that's what led to what they did. But if you read the next verse, because they say, look, see, that was the iniquity of Sodom. They were just proud. Well, no, that's not why God destroyed them, though. Amen. Verse 50 explains, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Amen. They committed abomination. Amen. You know, when a land, man lies with man, he lies with a woman. That's abomination. Amen. And that's what they were doing in the land of Sodom. And look, Genesis chapter 19, Judges chapter 19, this shows you who these really people really are. And it's no surprise that they want to gather around the house of God and, and you know, the next thing they're going to be doing is calling out for one of you guys, right? Bring out Pastor Mejia that we may know him, right? That's how they are. That's how they act. And, you know, if they, the, the more they can become accepted, that's going to be a real threat. I mean, that's a reality. We need to not let it get to that point. Amen. We need to wake people up with the truth, with the word of God, Amen. and help people understand what they're really about. Flip over to Philippians chapter 3. While you're going to Philippians 3, I'm just going to read from Jude verse 7 for you. Jude 7 reads, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Having a lot of prosperity allows you to get lifted up and proud. Having a lot of prosperity also will buy you a lot of time so you can end up being idle. Having a lot of empty time and idleness can lead you into these sins and not just into sins but to where you're giving yourself over to those sins 
That's what Sodom did. The Bible says they gave themselves over to fornication. And when, and when that's not enough, because just like with all sin, if you continue down whatever sinful path you're on, it's going to end up not giving you the same satisfaction that that sin was going to give you until you go deeper and farther and more and more and more. And it's a deadly cycle that's going to lead you. And again, it could be any sin. Okay, whatever your sin is, if you just enjoy it and want to just engulf yourself in that sin and give yourself over that sin, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And especially with these, you know, with these sexual sins, you've got these, these sodomites were giving themselves over. It started with the fornication to the point to where that wasn't enough. Then they have to start going after strange flesh. And it just became perverted. But they had a bunch of free time and a bunch of wealth. So what else are they going to do? And watch out for the pornography. It impacts a lot of people. That's also going to lead you down that weird, perverted path. And you know when that happens? When you, don't have, when you have a lot of free time on your hands? You want to avoid going down that type of a path? Keep yourself busy. Don't give yourself idle time. Keep busy. Keep working. There's all kinds of stuff to do. Amen. Hey, you, you need something to do. You say, I don't know. I have too much time on my hands. Talk to Pastor Mejia. I think, I, I think he can help you out and hook you up with some work to do. Amen. Is that true, brother? You got some work for people that just, just don't seem to know what to do with all the time they have? Seriously, though. Do you, want, you, don't, you don't want to have an abundance of idleness. Right. You don't want to allow yourself to get lifted up because God's blessed you. Keep yourself humble. And don't give yourselves over to any sin. Amen. Philippians 3, verse 17, the Bible reads, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. You know what we're doing tonight? We're marking those. We're marking them that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Amen. We're marking those whose end is destruction. Amen. We're marking those whose glory is in their shame. Yeah. They need to be marked. They need to be called out. They need to be avoided. And you know what? Why don't you mark the godly man instead of the, the faggot man and follow the godly man as an ensample? Isaiah chapter 5, last place I'll have you turn, Isaiah chapter 5. There's always going to be people that reject the Lord. There always has been. Their numbers swell and shrink depending on the state of the spirituality of the country in which they reside. There were was, there was some great times during the time of the, the, the days of Israel when he had those great kings like Jehoshaphat that would go and, and drive the Sodomites out of the land back when they would enforce God's law when it was illegal. Hey, there were some great times in this country too. I mean, you realize that, that sodomy was against the law in every state of this nation from its founding. And going back to the colonies, they even had the death penalty on it in many places. Amen. That's why God blessed this. That's, that's why God blessed this country. Because they were using biblical laws as their, as their laws. But there's always people that reject the Lord. And the biggest problem I have is when people who claim to believe the Bible, when people who claim to be Christians, and maybe even they really are, when they claim to believe all the scriptures that we just looked at tonight. Because it's found in the same Bible that they, they say they believe. When those people will call a good man of God evil and the wicked, abominable perverts good. That's when you really got a problem. Isaiah 5 verse 20, the Bible reads, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. 
that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know what? Would to God that some of these pastors and preachers and just Christians can grow a backbone and grow a spine, and instead of not wanting to be associated with those people because they're real hateful, how about you stand on the word of God and stand against wickedness and stand against abomination and stand against the faggots that are out here trying to destroy and creep in and defile and ruin the place that we're living in? Stand with the man of God. Mark them. And walk as you have us as an ensample. Hey, look, there's a lot of people that are starting to stand up against this garbage. Stand with us. It's easier for them to put a spotlight and showcase one church, one preacher, right? And try to say, oh, wow, look at this person. You know what? The more there are, it's a lot harder for them to use their slander to make it sound like or look like, oh, this is just this real small, weird, you know, extreme sect. Every Christian should be an extremist in the world's eyes. Because you should believe every word of God to be true. And stand on every word of God. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Verse 21, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And, I, and, and this isn't in the scripture. But I would say woe unto them that think they're more loving than God. Seriously. I, I don't know where these people get off when you can see God's judgment on things and you think that you're holier than God. Look, if God's going to reject someone, I'm not going to think I'm more loving because if, I, if, I, if I'm accepting the person that God rejects. Verse 22, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to, to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, it is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them and hath smitten them. Look at that. Reread that. Verse 25. Therefore, is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. Against his people. Why? Because they've cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. Why? Because they've called evil good and good evil. Don't be cast away with the trash. Stand with God. And the hills did tremble, and the carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Hey, when God decides to bring judgment down, it's going to be real. And you're going to know it's a judgment of God. Serious times we're living in. And you know what? I don't want to end on a down note. We need to be sober. We need to be aware, right? You can't just treat it lightly. I'm not going to say peace when there is no peace. But you know what? There's a lot of reason to hope, and there's no reason to fear. Amen. And I started talking about how things used to be, right? That wasn't that long ago. Let's bring it back. Let's bring back a culture that, that drives away the wicked and the perverts and the freaks. Yeah. And you know, the only way that's going to happen is by preaching from the housetops. Amen. God's word. That's the light. It's a dark world. It's, it's perverted. That's the way of the world. The only way to stay off the darkness is with light. You need to preach the light. Shine that light. And here's the thing. You can't let yourself be intimidated or back down because then where's it, who's going to shine that light? If you back down, you might as well just be helping the other side. And don't let them, you know, wh whether in the short term they've got the upper hand or not, the only way they can have the upper hand is in the world's eyes. 
You're not supposed to be looking with world's eyes. We know who wins. And it's not the fake love of sodomy. It's the love of God. God's going to win. And we know what side we're on. Let's be on his side. How about that? Let's be on God's side tonight. Let's make the decision. You know what? I'm going to be on God's side. Make a decision. I'm going to be here on Sunday. And I don't care who's out there. I don't care what they're saying. I don't care what type of filth they're promoting. I don't care what they might even try to do to me. I'm going to be on God's side. And you don't back down. They're going to back down. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Hey, equip yourself with the armor of God. And know what the Bible says? Just having done all to stand. You don't need to go out there waging war with some reprobate. Let God burn them quickly. That's the motto, right? That's a <laughs> that should be plastered on the wall. Right? Along with fags and speedos, go home. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this church. God, I thank you for the opportunity to, to preach here tonight. Lord, I pray that, that something in your word here would, would sink down into the hearts and minds of the people here, Lord. I pray that you please encourage them, edify them, Lord. Strengthen them during this time and, um, and continue to, to build this church. Lord, send the workers here. Bring them here to, to evangelize and to, and to preach the gospel and to spread that glorious light. Dear Lord, uh, we love you. We love your word. And uh, we, we're here to serve you. God, I pray that you please use us uh, to the best of our own, each abilities as, as you've given us of your gifts, dear Lord, and I pray that you would please just keep everybody safe. I pray that you please watch over your people, protect us, dear Lord, from the, the evil that, that the enemy would like to do, and that you would just, just watch over, lead, guide, Lord, and, and help give everyone here the spirit of boldness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.